Hey, what's up, everybody? We're back with another Weather Wednesday. Uh, this is the third one in the series now. Um, if you haven't caught the first two, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a card up here. You guys can check those out. Uh, don't do it right now. Wait until after this video, then you can go back and watch the rest of the playlist. Um, I got my buddy Mike Gronke back with me, uh, our resident meteorologist. And um, today we're going to be talking about some wind shear, some turbulence, some things that, uh, you know, you can look out for and make sure you do, that you try and avoid. Uh, we'll take a look at some wind charts and that kind of stuff and uh, kind of give a quick overview uh, just of that. We're not we're not going to try and go too in depth with this. Uh, I promise I'm in I'm in Miami again. And I promise we didn't record this uh, at the same time we recorded the other stuff. I, I have changed, showered, and everything else. It's been multiple days since the last time we've done any recording. Yep. It just looks the same because, you know, it's a hotel. The scenery is similar, but other than that, it's fine. <laughs> um, all right, Mike. So, like yeah. I said, we're going to talk about some wind shear stuff. Why don't you go ahead and show us some of the things you got? All right, cool. Um, figured I would start, um, off with, uh, just what is wind shear from, from the get go. Wind shear is a uh, change of wind speed and or direction, um, over a short distance. Um, I will admit as a meteorologist, we usually think of it, um, over with height, but, um, uh, for, for when you're flying, it can be in any direction. So it could be, um, when you're flying in a straight line, the wind shear, we'll call it horizontally change, you know, the, or sorry, the wind horizontally changes speed. That's wind shear. Um, or if you're flying in the wind chain um, north or north to east, whatever, um, that's considered wind shear as well. Um, so we can look at it. Uh, we'll look at it in a couple of different maps. So, you know, again, from a height perspective, but also from a horizontal perspective um, when you're going across. Um, some examples of things that cause wind shear. Uh, an extreme example would be a microburst. Um, I imagine that a lot of people are probably familiar with that. In fact, I actually have a little, I think. A little um, graphic here, or a little video. Ooh. That is a, an ex a rather ex extreme example of a what we call a wet microburst. It looks like the storm is just like puking out like a piece of the cloud, kind of. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, I think we, we talked about thunderstorms. Plug the other video. I have updrafts yeah. and downdrafts. Um, if the downdraft gets particularly strong, uh, they can get that piece that kind of comes out in the wind. The, Basically, of the the core of all that cooler air coming out of the storm that sinks down, and you can kind of see how it spreads out in all directions. You can imagine that, and really any piece of that, anything related to that or the aftermath, that you would not want to be flying an aircraft around. Um, yeah, <laughs> pretty pretty safe to say. Um, yeah, yeah, microbursts are probably um, probably not the most dangerous thing you could fly into, but they're they're pretty close. They're they're it's definitely up there. It's definitely up there. Yeah, I mean that area is clearly <laughs> dropping out of that thing very quickly. Um, obviously, you can imagine if you're flying and that comes through, it's shoving you right into the ground. But there actually is more than even just you know the position three of this little chart here would be if you're directly under it. Obviously, you're you're going to get pushed into the ground. But even if there was a microburst that occurs just ahead of you. You can see when you're coming in, it can be like a very sudden, extreme headwind, um, uh, which would obviously when you're uh, if you're in this chart approaching an airport um, and you're you know down around 500 feet, thousand feet, major quick changes in your headwind or tailwind are going to be um, a problem for you. It could probably cause a loss of speed and or altitude. Um, yeah, so so, at, so just uh, real quick, Mike. So when when um... Like when we're talking about this, you know, in class and that kind of stuff, we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, what the aircraft is going to do, especially the the seven six. Anyway, what it what it's going to do. Um, yeah. The the number two there, we actually call that a gain shear. Well, at least that's okay. what I call it anyway, because it's a it's a, a aircraft performance improving um, kind of thing Makes because sense. of yeah, that because of that air yeah. coming out. It makes it yeah. easier for it to keep speed and things like that. And then like four, we call it, that's the loss shear. So that's the, that's where you're on the other side of it. And now you've lost all the stuff that you just gained and you kind of sink out of the sky kind of thing. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so this is the reason why we don't fly in the, th in the airports in the middle of an active thunderstorm. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, and really it doesn't have to be, we talked about last time how it was considered a severe thunderstorm. Uh, would be if you have winds in excess of 60 miles an hour 
or one inch or greater hail. Um, it doesn't have to be a severe thunderstorm to have a, a random microburst. Um, and now, if you have a very strong or severe storm, you know, there's probably a more mature updraft and downdraft. I guess maybe there's a little bit higher chance, but you know, any old run of the mill um, a summer thunderstorm could be occurring and it finally just gets all of its stuff. It gets, that cloud just gets too heavy and it just dumps uh, that micro, that little downburst or microburst, whatever you want to call it, um, into one location. Um, and sometimes in the summer, I know as uh, talking to you know other fellow meteorologists, especially the ones working at the weather service who have to issue those warnings, they hate summer storms that when this occurs because it may actually cause briefly right where the microburst occurs very strong winds, which would be worthy of a warning. But by the time you see it on the radar, it's already occurred. <laughs> oh! And by time the by time they get the warning out, I mean if it's if it wasn't that severe a storm to begin with, it probably was briefly bad when that microburst hit the ground. And by the time they get the warning out, it's like the wind's already kind of dispersing and slowing down. And so there's almost even no point to issuing the warning at that point. Yeah, and see so, that's that's one of those things I think that kind of make us distrust weather guys. Yeah, yeah. You're saying and, and, yeah, and I've and seen that before. Outside going, this is beautiful. Right, exactly. Um, or it's like you're you're getting hit by a, a summer thunderstorm. Now I'm talking like we call them the garden variety, right? There's just there's some thunder, there's a little lightning, there's heavy rain, there's not much wind. Maybe somewhere in the storm there was that little microburst they saw on the radar. They try to warn it so they can you know get you know credit for for you know the if there was damage or whatever. But um, it, it, most of the people in that warning are going to not get severe weather. So, um, but point is though that can occur in even your normal you know run of the mill thunderstorms during the summer so even if there's no severe thunderstorm warning even if there's not some crazy wicked line of storms if there's a cell over the airport or right by the airport i mean your approach path you don't want to go through it's basically the kind of the moral of the story so so let me ask you this i i mean i know i know we're not talking really about about thunderstorms or anything like that we're talking about the wind that's associated with this um but is it possible to have a storm produce more than one microburst or is a microburst kind of like the, the dissipating, like I'm done kind of thing for a thunderstorm? Um, I guess if it was a, it, it depends on what type of storm it is and like how, how that storm is developing and what's going on. We, we talked a little bit last time about how, when you have um, uh, more wind shear in the atmosphere that can kind of help regenerate thunderstorms and keep them going. Yeah. Um, and so if you have that situation, I would say absolutely. You may have, you know, the, the one initial parent updraft that finally dies out and it, it causes a downburst. So that I'd say in the instance of just that one poor updraft, that's probably it kind of dying or that's its final stage. But if you have a situation where stuff's redeveloping very easily, you, you know, it, I guess technically it's a new updraft that'll cause the next microburst, but. For, for all intents and purposes, for you know, you and me, normal people looking here outside of the weather, you know, you, you don't really care that oh, a, a second updraft develops. As far as you're concerned, it's the same thunderstorm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know? it didn't change so, position. It's all still there. Yeah, yeah, it may you may ever you may see some, and maybe in Florida actually, may get some instances where there's a little burst of lightning, then it kind of calms down for a little bit, but then like 20 minutes later, there's another big burst of lightning, and that's because you had a, a, a main updraft that was very mature and producing a lot of lightning it kind of fizzled out while the other one's developing and you have that little kind of lull in between um, gotcha. where there's not as much, but there's still rain. So it's still raining the whole time because the, right. the new updraft has gone to develop before all the rain's gone. So, well, and, and so, the main reason I, guess the I answer is that question, depends, which is, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the main reason I asked that question is because like, you know, if you're coming in on approach and um, you get the, you get the wind shear, wind shear, wind shear, and you get out of the wind shear because you you're flying through the microburst essentially or yeah. oh, close to it anyway, yeah. not necessarily through it. Um, that you know you're like oh okay, and then you kind of fly away from it, and then you kind of hope that it dissipates by the time you come back. Um, you know it would just it would kind of be a bad situation I think where if you're like oh yeah I'm good the microburst is already gone and then you get hit by exactly. something, you get hit by another one um, yeah. kind of thing exactly. Yeah, so there, there's definitely too many situations where it there could definitely be another one that's that's going to happen. So yeah, I would say it would not be safe to assume that it, that's the only one. Okay. So again, that's an extreme example of, of wind shear that is over a very small area, very just extreme levels of wind change. Obviously, um, more average example, which we'll get into here in a second, jet stream winds. Um, uh, they're 
that tends to be over kind of a larger area. Uh, you're not going to have that extreme, like, you know, giant microburst pushing your plane at like 40,000 feet. But you can obviously, there's been plenty of examples of it's very severe turbulence caused by um, jet stream winds. Um, so we'll go through a few ways to kind of avoid uh, or maybe predict or at least see where wind shear currently is. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, PIREPs are a great way, pilot reports, um, great way to see what's currently happening. Um, they're available uh, momentarily. I'll show you on the aviation weather page um, and also a number of other platforms out there. Um, I will caution that they're not you know the end all like just because someone has a report of the turbulence doesn't mean that you won't be the first one to feel it <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. certainly it's not a guarantee um but it, it's definitely helpful it's like i mean if you're if you're planning a flight from um you know miami to chicago and there's a number of moderate turbulence reports at you know thirty four thousand feet or whatever over kentucky it's worth noting that you know there's certainly a lot of people currently experiencing experiencing turbulence there um and and you're it's with the area where you're going into so okay uh wind charts you can glean uh some information off of that kind of see where there may be some uh sharp changes in wind direction with either uh horizontal you know uh change or with, with altitude change um i threw on there also convective sigmas and radar that's more of do along with what we just talked about microbursts but you know if you're uh, we talked about convective sigmas and storms last time so i won't go into that yeah. too much here right now but definitely primarily because of microbursts or like a gust front associated with a, th a thunderstorm, those are definitely a source of um, of, what, of, of what could be a lot of wind shear and turbulence. And so if you're in a, going into a convective segment or you're flying into a, a, what's obviously a storm on radar, definitely an area where, where there's a, a strong possibility of that occurring. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So we'll go, uh, before I go to the, the aviation weather page, just thought I real quickly. I'm not going to go through all of this. There's a lot on this on this this website, um, but I thought it was it was um, it was useful. This is actually off of weather.gov. This, this is actually a, a NOAA website. Um, real fast. First of all, uh, just your your intensities of turbulence. Right, you have light light turbulence, just slight or ragged changes in altitude, moderate um, change in altitude um, or attitude, but the aircraft remains in positive control at all times. Um, severe turbulence, there's large abrupt changes in altitude or attitude. The aircraft may be momentarily out of control, but that's not, severe turbulence is not, you know, when you see in the movies, you know, like the crazy, <laughs> yeah, every, everything's just complete loss of control. That's your next one, which is very, I, I, I would say very rare. Um, probably, probably more rare than is reported because I think in a lot of instances we know kind of where this, this may occur, but um, it just also doesn't happen as much, but Extreme, obviously, just anything above severe, where it's um, basically you're completely losing control of the aircraft. Um, you could be getting into structural damage. You could be just probably going to be injuries on board. I mean, there could be injuries caused by severe turbulence. I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard of this. That the cases where there's you just you lose like five thousand feet or whatever in a very short period of time. Um, obviously, if you're not buckled in, it's not going to be a very good situation for you. Yep. Uh, um, I think uh, I can't remember who it was, but there was an airline that just had that happen. They had uh, somebody in the bathroom. Um, oh, I think somebody in the bathroom, somebody in the aisle, and like a flight attendant was up or something like that. And when they yeah. when it when the airplane dropped, everybody went up and hit you know yep. the ceiling and causes injuries. Uh, I will say though, one thing when it comes to like when it comes to those, <laughs> you're probably going to see things. It's all subjective. Right. It is. So, yeah. So like if somebody says, oh, man, that was moderate turbulence. Well, to somebody else, that might not have been moderate turbulence. might have been might have been light turbulence, um, you know, and the same thing kind of was severe and extreme. I mean, if you're not used to going through those things, if you're not used to going through any kind of turbulence, when you hit a, a, a section of turbulence that kind of makes you feel like it's throwing you around, you're going to be like, holy hell, that was that was severe. That was extreme. Yep. Yeah. Um, and when in actuality, it really wasn't. Um, and if any, if anybody's watching this, that is not a pilot, you're just kind of interested in this kind of thing and, uh, whatever. And, or if you're, you know, do a lot of flying or haven't done a lot of flying, but want to, uh, realize that the airplanes are built to withstand a lot before anything actually happens to them. Uh, that's you, why you can see there, there's no, there's no notation of 
of structural damage until the absolute worst case extreme. Right. And even then it's may it's cause may. not that it yeah. will cause structural damage, you know. Exactly. So, yeah, you they're know, they're built and, for it because we, we know it's gonna happen. So right. And and like I said, the, the aircrafts they're they're built for it. They can withstand they can withstand so much before anything like really bad happens in any kind of any kind of turbulence. I will admit, if you're traveling on an airplane, if you sit towards the back of the airplane, you're going to feel it more than if you sit towards the front of the airplane. I suggest yeah. if you can afford it to sit in first class, simply because you don't feel the turbulence as much and you get meals. Like I don't, I don't know why anybody else wouldn't do that. Or at least just yeah, you know, if you just pay for the, the pick your <laughs> pick your seat in the economy, you can kind of get that more towards the middle. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, something yeah, like but that. definitely if you if you're sitting, I mean, last two, three, four rows. I mean, I've sat back there. We've just went through like little bumps. I mean, if you you're you're doing this in yeah. the back, like it's it's not okay. It's still an uneasy yep. feeling, even even when I know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, it does also, I'll just quick call off because you'll see this sometimes in pyreps. They'll say like moderate chop, chops types of turbulence that causes rapid and somewhat rhythmic bumpiness. That's when you're getting the kind of like the ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump. Yeah, going along, they'll, they'll call that chop, but it's, it's really just type of turbulence. Um, so, main causes of turbulence, we kind of went through a, a couple uh, examples before, but these are all your major ones. Mechanical turbulence, that is the air actually being um, disrupted by something physically. Uh, the main thing of this would be mountain wave turbulence. So uh, you may have heard of before, like seeing a cap cloud or a, a standing lenticular cloud over a, a, a mountain. That is a, it's it just, it's what well, you can see on this little picture here. This little, this little, um, uh, almost like a saucer kind of looking cloud. Um, if you ever see that over a mountain, well, that is basically being caused by the conditions that cause mountain wave turbulence. Basically mountain wave turbulence you have, if you, you can picture with the, there. The, there's the, you have the mountain, the wind going perpendicular to the mountains. And as that air goes, it hits the mountain. It undulates and and it gets the flow gets disrupted. Um, you could, if you ever are really nerdy, you can go through all the exact details. Of like you, know, you need stable air to make it more likely to occur, and little change in wind sh in direction with height. But um, the the main thing is if you see um, this happens the most out in the Rockies. Obviously, and that's, that's our that's our major mountain chain here in the U.S. If you see a uh, very strong, uniform like west to east flow across the Rockies, that's perpendicular, right? Because the Rockies go north, north south. Um, but if you see you know, uniform, especially as you go up in the atmosphere, strong flow from west to east, that's going to tend to cause some mountain wave turbulence. Um, um, and then depending on some of those other minor uh, characteristics here, you might you might make make it more or less likely to occur as well. But that's one cause of, of clear air turbulence. That's another way that would be bright because you, other than that little cloud that develops over the mountain, all this downwind, if you will, you know, air, um, is, is that, that's clear air turbulence effectively. Um, you have thermal turbulence. Um, so anyone who's ever flown around a small little plane <laughs> on a nice hot summer day has probably experienced this. Um, so uh, we actually went over. What, what convective cells are in the last video, not to keep plugging shamelessly, but hey, we need to go over it. <laughs> um, but those little convective cells of, of rising and sinking air, um, that's, that, that is that is going to cause turbulence because you have that air going up and going down. You're, you're flying perpendicularly through that. Um, and it's going to be changes in wind speed because of that. So um, it, it's funny because you don't think of it like if it's a hot, sunny day, you're thinking like, oh, it's beautiful weather. It's perfect, you know. That actually is the perfect day to have this kind of type of turbulence occur, um, because the air is um, is uh, is very is very turbulent from on a vertical perspective, if you will, right? Because you have all that you have the sun hitting hitting the earth, heating up the, the air at the, at the ground, and the hot air rises. Um, yeah, and then puffy cloud. The other the other part of that is this this is also um, if I remember right, I, I actually think I read it somewhere in there. Uh, it's the uneven heating, right? Of the earth's surface yeah it's kind of mm -hmm. it's kind of really what causes it um yep. okay so, yeah so know. basically e each little cumulus cloud is in a little hotter zone where the air the air um got a little bit hotter than the air around it i mean that little convective parcel and that parcel of air rises and eventually it hits the point where they start to condense and that's where you get the little cumulus cloud um, gotcha. and then a, a bigger example of that would be if it if there's a, a larger convective cell and it turns into an actual thunderstorm at that point. 
So yeah, I love I love the graphic that they get. It makes it look right? like the yeah. world's on fire. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Don't uh, don't land there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next one probably seems kind of obvious, but frontal turbulence. This is just when you have a um, a, 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 we have another video we're going to talk about fronts and pressure systems. But um, when you're going across a front, there's going to be an air mass change. There's typically going to be a, some kind of jet stream associated with that. Um. Also, some some lifting action of air, whatnot. That's definitely a zone where there can there can be turbulence. It's not a guarantee. It's not like if there's a cold front coming through the entire cold front, you're going to get a big bump when you go over it. Something like that. But it's a zone where the, 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 there's there's a little bit a little bit higher increased chance of, of something going on. Um, and then the last one is what we've been kind of going over this whole time, but wind just wind shear in general. That's the that's the the, the air um, or the wind speed, wind speed changes in the jet stream. Um, if you basically what you're going to be looking for are abrupt changes. So that could be an abrupt change where the winds, you know, 50 knots at 15,000 feet, but it's only 20 knots at 10,000 feet. You know, so you got an abrupt change with height or it could be where there's a real uh, map, which we'll look at here in a second, a narrow zone of strong winds that you're going to kind of fly through. Um, so we'll get into that here. Um, I'll actually, I'll just, I'll go ahead and pull up this map here. here here's, here's the, there's the, not upper level wind speed chart. This is on Aviation Weather Center. Um, sorry if I'm trying to figure out how to get this to work. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, this is going to date this video, but they just changed this website. The um, uh, way, way, way we get here, actually, I'll just go back to here, um, is uh, you do uh, da, 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 you go into the uh, observations, go winds, and then it, it, it plots this here for you. Let me move my thing out of the way here to make sure I don't have Anything turned on? I don't want. Nope. We're good. Um, so uh, let me pull up the legend real fast. So just to give you an idea, obviously, you know, as you might have guessed, red is stronger. But what we're looking at on here is anything that's kind of that orange color is, you know, 40, 50 knots. Um, get into the red, you're up 80 to 100. And actually right now there's a pretty pretty good sized jet streak out here over the ocean. Um, uh, looks like over over 150 knots. So that's, that's pretty strong, especially for this time of year. Um, jet street. So um, at this point, at this point, what altitude do you like? Is this set? That was the oh, that was the maximum wind speed. So I can we'll, we'll go back through. I mean, it's going to be okay. The strongest winds are generally going to be up high. Like you know, you're, yeah, you got some issues if you have a 150 knot jet stream at like 5,000 feet or <laughs> <obviously>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, so the the left side here again, they did just change this website, so this is the first yeah. time I'm seeing it too. Uh, here on the left side, that is going to be your flight level. So at, at the this this chart will go through the different yes. flight levels and tell you what your different wind speeds are at that different flight levels. Yep, that is correct. So, um, so one thing, uh, so let's say you're going across, you're expecting. Uh, fly at thirty six thousand feet. Most of your crews, so you can maybe you're, maybe you're looking at from let's say from Ohio out to Montana, um, uh, and you're 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 looking at this chart. This is what you're going to be looking at for most of your flight. But um, for your um the, the, for your departure and your arrival, you're going to obviously be climbing and 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 uh, descending. And that is where you're going to care more about as you, you know, go down or vice versa going up when you're taking off. Um, is there large changes in wind speed um, with height? Um, so I'm looking at, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I understand most pilots aren't going to probably be looking at the individual levels here. You're probably just like, look, cut to the chase. What's the turbulence for? <laughs> but just to give you a little bit idea of like the science behind it and what like a forecaster is looking for, what the models are looking at to figure out where the most um, turbulence is going to be. Um, uh, well, I, one thing I, one area I, I noticed up just a minute ago, um, was out here in Montana. Uh, it, it does, when you're at 27,000 feet and you go up to like 36, you get a, pr a pretty sharp increase there of that oranges or reds in there. So you're going from, you know, 40, 50 knots up to a hundred knots, which is a 50 knot change over, you know, like a five, 10,000 foot area. So that, that might be one where I, I would expect that there could be some, a little bit of uh, turbulence if you're departing or descending through that. Um, um, now, I will say, if you look out here, you may see this giant 
you know, area of jet stream and go, oh my gosh, that's going to be terrible, right? That's not necessarily the case. That's just a large, broad jet stream. And it's going to be a strong headwind or tailwind, which is going to obviously impact your you know, flight time. But um, what we're caring more about is when there's a, a quick, sharp change. So if you look at this, this jet stream out here, for the most part, that is, as you move to the south down here over the ocean or mostly out to the west, it gets a little bit more abrupt as you get towards the, clo- uh, towards the coast. But this is kind of easing down relatively smooth you know what i mean so this would not necessarily be something i'd be that terribly concerned about um i'd actually be a little more concerned about this area over eastern ohio where you go from nothing to all of a sudden um you know almost 80 knots of flow pretty quickly um over this pretty short span uh, area here so we'll we'll look at the turbulence forecast in a second and see if this lines up or if mike just doesn't know what he's talking about um, so so uh, along with that, we're talking about a speed and, and direction change. Uh, yes. So what about like out towards, um, was that Nevada where it's kind of going, it's kind of going west to east and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's going like direct south. Uh, are you talking about like down, like right, right. Yeah. Here? Like Arizona, Nevada, like Utah, like in that kind yeah. of area. Cause you can see coming from like Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, you're you're running left or right, and then yeah. all of a sudden now you're running like direct south. Like, is is that something that, that would cause turbulence, or is that a uh, far enough away to where you may not really notice it? Um, I would say this is a relatively gradual change. It's that's that's not anything terribly crazy. I mean, there there is there definitely is a. I mean, that you have a ninety degree change in wind speed over here over the course of a couple of states, so. Yeah, I mean, a, a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say it's anything where it's going to be like, oh my gosh, like don't fly through that. That's like severe turbulence right. or anything. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that, I would say there there could be um, a little bit of of uh, at least light turbulence associated with with that kind of uh, directional um, change there in the wind. Now, what I don't care about as much as down here, like Arizona, where you get that big change, but the wind speed's almost nothing. So, oh, you know, okay. The wind direction changing from north to e- from north to west uh, when it's like ten knots doesn't really matter. Um, so, but when you have a, a, you know, a stronger flow and you get that change, then it could it, it could matter a little bit more. Um, so we'll gotcha. go into. I f- think it actually is over here. Here we go. Turbulence. <coughs> so what I'm gonna do is. Turn off the sigmets and all that good stuff. There we go. And I think I got in the forecast. Maybe. Or it's just not going to load. Oh, there's, there's, uh, there's that too. Hey, everyone, there's no turbulence. How about that? We're not. <laughs> the, to this page what was that. it? The... I think I've got the. I have the cameras over where I want to. Um. If I can get this to go. Well, I don't. This was working just a little bit. Oh, there we go. Okay, I had to go out in time more. I don't know why it just doesn't want to load. The, if you want to know the turbulence in two hours, you just don't get to know it, apparently. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll go out to this. Is just a couple hours now. This is going to be this is going to be similar. Um, so we'll take it up to 36,000 feet, um, where, uh, which is the map that we were just kind of looking at. So it is pin, uh, picking out a little bit there, Brandon, where you got that wind direction change from north to remember, remember that you had that north I think yeah. it was north yeah, yeah. actually um, going into, into the westerly so and also that area is the Rocky Mountains so where it's starting to turn west <coughs> it's going across the um, it's going across the mountains as well so that's going to enhance that a little bit uh, with that turbulence um, looks like it's also picking up on what I mentioned out here over eastern Ohio western PA Nothing crazy, oh, yeah, where but there is, there is a little bit. Something. You know. So, yeah, I would imagine if you're flying on, on Delta today from New York to Chicago, when you're halfway across, you're, you're going to get at least a little choppy through there. You know, there, there you're, you're getting into um, you're getting into a uh, uh, that that change in jet stream. And, I, and it's also picking up on that where that big, the really big, broad uh, jet streak was kind of just south of where this orange is. And I, I mentioned that kind of flank there was was a little bit more abrupt change in, in the in that wind speed so it's picking up on that out there as well 
Um, I'm just kind of curious. I, mean, I mentioned the change in wind speed with height over Montana. Yeah. Looks like it is, yeah, 36,000 feet. There's like nothing. Because again, it was just a big, broad area of strong wind, but it, it, it dropped off quickly in that 10,000 feet below 36,000 feet. And you can see it does start to pick up on the little more turbulence there as you draw yeah. down through. Um, now, now I, is that the, the almost, because the, there's no real, and here I am just stuttering all over the place. Um, the, the orange is the, like, that's there you go. I was trying to see the key, but I, I didn't know where Sorry. the was. Uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, okay, the so orange the, the orange, the worse it is. Yeah. Yes. And it, my guess is you're not gonna see it predicting at least severe turbulence that frequently. Um, or it's certainly I don't I don't think I've even ever seen seen this thing predict extreme turbulence. <laughs> you may see it predict a, a closer to severe. Um but yeah, so that the, the the yellows and oranges. I mean, if you're getting into that orange, it's probably not a super pleasant flight. You know? Right. Um, one thing I don't think we mentioned, but worth saying, is obviously the size of aircraft you're in matters a lot too. Uh, in yeah. fact, it actually yeah. it actually mentions it, it has, shows it here. You know, you have the little chart, and then it has different levels for light, medium, and heavy. Um. Which used to be easy to figure out how to switch the aircraft uh, from what aircraft type you're on, but I don't, I don't actually know where that is on here. Now. Well, it looks like there's a um, there. You got the airplane button and a helicopter button. Now this is between like hello, like low altitude, low altitude mode versus, versus high altitude. general aviation. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, if you're flying in a little small business jet or you know Piper Cub or something, even <laughs> it's gonna be a yeah, lot of difference. I, then if you're in a 737, and even a 737 versus like a 787, it's going to have a difference in, yeah. in severity. Yeah, yeah. and at <laughs> so, that point, at that point, you almost want to be in a 74 or A380. You want to be in the the biggest yeah. airplane you can get. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Turbulence? What turbulence? Yeah, I didn't feel anything. <laughs> um. All right, I'm gonna pull up real fast. Uh, the the pilot reports. So, actually, I think if you just go to just the observations in general, it's going to, we just got to go over here. There's this, now there's, it used to be there's like a different menus you could go through on here to figure out what, what you want. Now there's just this little layers thing and you can put on as much stuff as you want. So, so I'll put on the pie reps. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, now we are recording this in the evening. I will admit so there's not as much traffic out there. Um, So, you know, which also, I guess, worth worth noting. If you're planning uh, an overnight flight, you know, uh, or late evening, super early morning, um, as I mentioned at the start of the video, pilot reports are only as good as the, the people that are out there that report it. So if you're flying through an area where there aren't any other planes flying, or at a time of day where it's kind of quiet, you're not, you know, just because there's nothing there doesn't mean it's not there. Um, uh, on the, uh, let me get the legend here. So here's your uh, here's your symbols. The pilot reports map includes icing as well, but um, these little mountain top looking things is is uh, turbulence. You got nil, so that, that's just the reporting. It's all all clear. Light, moderate. The red one here is, uh, is severe, and then the little squiggly is someone reported low level wind shear. Well, and then what's um, funny so, is if you if you look there, the where the low level wind shear is is right next to a, a light turbulence. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, this says, so when you have these uh, these pyreps, this website actually decodes it a little bit for you. It gives you the flight level, so that's 8,000 feet. Um, this was just says tur turbulence, I think that's continuous, light to moderate, eight to 14,000 feet. Um, but this is this is kind of getting like above. So I think what they're saying here is there was some wind shear down at eight thousand feet, and then as they climbed up to fourteen thousand feet, it was just some light turbulence. Well, so that actually looks that actually looks like it was two different airplanes, though, right? Uh, it could have been two different airplanes. I guess I, my my point was that you that you one's eight thousand feet, one's fourteen thousand feet, so you have kind of right, different right, right, right. altitudes. You know, um, as far as these, so this is a. Where's the aircraft type here? I think it's the it's right here. 
Nine yeah, hell. So it's uh, like a beach jet or something like that. And that's a uh, uh, up at the top a where jet. it says a Lear. Oh, here you go. Got yeah. urgent pirate Lear jet, jet seventy five. Yeah. So looking at that, so that says that says light to moderate eight to fourteen, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the low level wind shear is at eight thousand. Yeah. So I that's I, I don't know I maybe maybe that's just me reading too much into it but it seems like right kind of where the the turbulence starts then you'd kind of get that low level wind shear at least according to these two airplanes yeah yep agreed and then um it, uh, uh I guess props to Brandon the only place where there's a cluster of moderate turbulence reports <laughs> part <laughs> where you pointed out the wind shear and again. Not not uncommon to you with just being near the near the Rocky Mountains and everything. Sure. Um, but but uh here's here's someone reporting um you know moderate turbulence um at thirty seven thousand feet. Um sky this clear is, too. Yeah, sky clear. So that's clear clear air turbulence. Um and this like they, they reported their call signs. So if someone wants to look up what United that's, Airlines nine two three is United Airlines. Whatever whatever aircraft type that is. Um so yeah, good stuff. Uh, you'll see. Uh, we're we're recording this video during kind of a little bit of a boring time for weather. Uh, when you get more into the winter, um, the map is never this clear, and that's just because of the can seasonal. Can you go on? The, I, I don't, I'm sorry, man. I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, you're you. On the bottom there, can you? This that's going into the past, right? So we can kind yeah, of so we, earlier we can, get, today. we can get a little bit more uh, this afternoon. Maybe we'll do this here, so you can see clearly the area for turbulence was. Kind of the areas you and I both highlighted, Montana yeah. and the and the the Rockies today. But I mean, if you go through here, there's a couple uh, low level wind shear ones here. You got several. You got a moderate at sixteen thousand. Quite a few moderates, um, kind of all around. So you got fifteen thousand, thirty two thousand, thirty six thousand. There's a severe 40, one down in Arizona. Uh, yeah, you're right. There it is. Now this was is that is that a, it's a beach jet right? I think it's a beach jet, yeah. Which is, I mean, it's not a it's not a real big airplane, so yeah. Like and like you mentioned, it is subjective, so right. You know, yeah. Um, and you but, know, looking uh, at that, if you're flying, if you're flying a beach jet, or if you're flying a, we'll we'll just say if you're flying like a beach jet or a Cirrus or something like that, and you see where a, a big airplane. A, uh, narrow body or wide body aircraft, so like a seven three, seven six, seven five, seven four. Um, if they are saying that it's turbulent, it's probably not a good idea for your little itty bitty airplane. Yeah, that's, that's fly true. where the big airplanes are saying there's turbulence. Um, but vice versa too. If you're if you're flying in the big airplanes and you're you're looking at your weather reports, and you're like, well, shit, there's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of turbulence through here. If yeah. it's done by a bunch of Cessnas and and you know small airplanes, then well, I, you may not even notice it. Yeah, exactly. So um, obviously today it looks like the concentration of stuff was out to the west, which kind of makes sense uh, just based on where um, uh, we talked about mountain wave turbulence, but also you just where the strongest current jet stream is. Um, you know, you've got a little bit of a jet out over the Ohio Valley, but right now at least over his, the land area of the U.S. It's more concentrated out to the west and you can see there's a few reports of some of light turbulence out to the east but nothing too crazy so it's mostly out in the rockies today seems to be um, icing more out that direction yes well it is stupid cold the last couple of days so that makes yeah sense. i wouldn't know i've been in miami <laughs> yeah you wouldn't mm -hmm. Yep, us here in Ohio have been like, where did January come from? What? <laughs> it was like high in the 40s the last couple of days, even though Holy it was like 80 a week. Ago. Yeah. But it actually, to your point, uh, not to sidetrack too much, it was it was cold. It was We've had a very kind of big upper low with a lot of cloud cover. So that makes sense. There'd be there'd be icing um, uh, over, over in our part of the country. So um, I, what I was saying before, was as far as it being busy with the pyraps here and turbulence, um, you're going to generally get more of that in the winter just because of the seasonality of the jet. Um, the jet stream tends to be further south during the winter time. It drops into the country. In fact, I usually joke with people that if you don't want turbulence, you should just not fly in the winter time because <laughs> there's really 
you're never going to have a perfectly smooth or you're almost never going to have a perfectly smooth flight in the wintertime. It's just, it's very unlikely. Um, you know, you, you may have one where there's just a few light bumps versus it's just a really crappy flight. But, um, you know, if, if there's jet stream winds, you know, any kind of decent jet going through, it, you're going to get at least a little something um, when you're flying. Um, well, that's encouraging it, knowing I have to fly down here about exactly twice a month yeah. over the next three or four months. <laughs> yeah. So, again, might be just a couple light bumps, nothing crazy. But, I mean, it's, it's just... Um, it, it's just less likely to have a, a smooth flight, you know, when you you just have a higher occurrence of storm systems coming through in the winter and stuff. Whereas in the summer, and particularly late summer, you get to like August, September, early October, that's the furthest north progression of the jet stream. Basically, it goes almost exclusively into Canada at that point um, before it Jeez. starts to oscillate okay. back south. So, um so that is that's really the bulk of what I had. I don't, I don't know if you had anything else or anything. Any no, man, that, no that's or... good. Um, I mean, it, you know, it's it's like I, like I said, I didn't want to get too too far into it, too deep into it. But I mean, yeah. I, that's a good a quick overview of it. Um, you know, obviously, if you're if you're just starting out flying, uh, when I started, I mean, I I don't have any licenses or certificates yet. But uh, when I started doing my private stuff thermals uh caught me off guard um yeah i wasn't i wasn't used to it my instructor used to laugh at me because every time we kind of like bounce in a thermal i would just white knuckle like real hard because i I didn't (laughs) right hated that feeling well you're probably thinking when you're going when you're on the fly you're like oh it's a beautiful day yeah you know absolutely what could go wrong today it's gorgeous it's sunny it's hot it's great you know yeah, and the moment you take off, everything everything's doing this, and you're yeah. you're just it doesn't feel right. And you know, my instructor used to laugh, and she would just she would just say, "It's just a little thermal. It's fine. It's just a little thermal." Just a little thermal. And yeah. you know, you you get used to it, and and whatever else. Um, but you know, when you when you start flying, you know, higher altitudes, and you start dealing with a little bit more turbulence, a little bit more turbulence, you kind of you kind of realize what the airplanes are able and capable of taking. Yeah. Uh, and it, it ends up not not really bothering you as much. Um, maybe I don't know. Some people, some people, regardless of what they can do, where it, it <laughs> there's some, never. There's some very nervous flyers out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, one of our mutual friends, she absolutely hates getting onto an airplane. She has to take medication to be good, yep. even if it's a smooth flight. So it, it, that doesn't she, really She had to fly her. this week, and actually I, I gave her a turbulence forecast, which I'll just toot my own horn. She said it ended up being accurate. Oh, nice. Very nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, there's definitely some very nervous flyers out there. I thought, I'll tell you the, you know, as you mentioned in the last video, I, I where I work, I talk to them sometimes, and um, I swear sometimes I'm just like, I have to talk them onto the airplane. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be okay, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but then you got the people who are kind of like, I need to get somewhere and there's a severe line of storms. Why can't we just fly under it? <laughs> Actually, I had that question too before, which we talked about in this video, why you shouldn't do that. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, yep. and then you got the whole spectrum out there of people who just, they don't care versus they're overly, overly terrified. Yeah, well, either way, man, uh, whoever whoever's watching this, whether you're just starting out, whether you've been around for a while, whether you're an ATP, whether you fly big planes, little planes, it doesn't matter. Hopefully you found something useful out of this video. Um, you know, even if, yeah, yeah, honestly, even if you fly big airplanes and every once in a while you want to go fly little airplanes, it's always good to kind of get refreshers on what to look for and what to be careful with. Um, yeah. You know, again, I, I appreciate Mike being here. Uh, again, always going to do the shameless plug, like, subscribe, comment, like, and subscribe. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Every, anything and everything that can kind of help the channel be seen and get into that algorithm and, and let it kind of, yeah. let it kind of go that way. Uh, I know there's a bunch of people that are, that are subscribed. So I, I, I definitely need more if I can. <laughs> that might not be the case when someone's watching this in 10 years. Oh, I know. That's crazy. They're going to be like, what is he talking about? He has a million subscribers. What yeah. about Mr. Humble yeah. over here? You know, As, you know everybody starts somewhere. Everybody exactly. starts somewhere. And yeah. if, you know, the big thing with, with this, and I, I know I've told you this, Mike, but um, if I can if I can help anybody understand something, um, then, that, then it's a win for me. Um, I'm an instructor by trade. 
I love to teach. And if I can, if I can get anybody's light bulb to come on, then that, that's all I ask for. That's all I ask for. But again, like, subscribe, comment, tell us if you like the video, if you want to see more stuff like this, if there's stuff you want us to cover, want us to go over, uh, things that maybe you don't understand, maybe we can try and talk about it and, and kind of work it out from there. Uh, on that note, that's going to conclude this uh, Weather Wednesday. We'll see you again next week where we're going to talk about some uh, different pressure systems. We're going to talk about low pressure, high pressure, uh, and kind of some weather be associated with that. So really hope to see and you stay tuned one. to find out if the picture behind Brandon changes <laughs> or the we'll shirt see. for that or the shirt. Will yeah. the shirt change? Will the you shirt gotta change? Click the next video. So you'll, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. All right. See ya.